All right, so we have the last panel of our day. It's going to be a very good one. And let me introduce our panelists, and uh, they'll each speak for 10 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions. So, panelists. Fred Geddix teaches at Brigham Young University Law School, where he holds the Guy Anderson Chair. He's the author of two books on the subject of religious freedom, The Rhetoric of Church and State, A Critical Analysis of Religion Clause Jurisprudence, and Choosing the Dream, The Future of Religion in American Public Life. The title of Professor Geddick's presentation today is Substantial Burdens, How Courts May and Why They Must Judge Burdens on Religion. Mark Scarberry teaches law at Pepperdine Law School. He came to law teaching after four years at the law firm of Jones Day, Revis, and Pogan, LA. The topic of his presentation today is strategic targeting of sincere religious complicity claims. You don't know what your religion requires. <laughs> Chad Flanders is our third panelist. He's an associate professor at St. Louis University School of Law. He teaches and writes in the area of criminal law, constitutional law, and philosophy of law. The title of his presentation today is Who's Complicity? Which Accommodation? When Conscience Cuts Both Ways. Michael Peabody is partner at the law firm of Bradford and Berthiel. He writes and speaks frequently on issues involving liberty of conscience. The topic of his presentation is Seeking Peaceful Solutions When Accommodating You Doesn't Accommodate Me. So please welcome, to, I will welcome to the podium, Professor Gettys. Thank you for that introduction, and, and thanks to Bob Cochran for this invitation and for putting together uh, this panel. Uh, I've learned a lot from uh, Professor Scarberry of Flanders uh, from prior exchanges on this issue. And uh, I, I didn't know Michael Peabody before uh, this conference, but I think his approach has real promise, although I fear it might have had more promise 20 years ago than it has right now. But, but Michael didn't attack my position, and, and Mark and Chad did, or they will in a few, in a few minutes. So I'm going to concentrate my remarks on them. Uh, Refer provides relief from substantial burdens, unless the government satisfies the compelling interest least restrictive needs test. When is a burden on religion substantial? And who decides? Oh, it does adjust. Not that good? Well, we'll see. I can put it anywhere you want. No, that's all right. You can, also pull it. you can also pull it out and walk around if you want. Mostly, I just wish it weren't there. <laughs> um, Mark argues that substantial burden means substantial theological burden. And courts, of course, are barred from addressing theological questions. So if this is what substantial burden means, uh, then this, this reading of uh, REFRA leaves the claimant, the believer of the religious institution, as the sole judge of whether a law imposes a substantial burden and thus whether the claimant is presumptively entitled to a REFRA exemption. Now, Chad ends up in the same place by a different route. Uh, he maintains a substantial burden means any burden. It's not a matter of quantity or quality. It's, as long as the government is making the claimant do something, However objectively trivial that something may seem, the claimant has established a substantial burden. Uh, I disagree with them both. Uh, substantial burden, in my view, means legally cognizable burden. That is, the burden on religion alleged by the claimant uh, must be recognized by the law as substantial. Uh, this reading is faithful to the legislative history of REFRA to the Supreme Court precedent that REFRA was meant to restore, and perhaps most important, it makes the most sense. Uh, let me start with that last point, the, uh, the sensibility point. Uh, I was actually trying to explain this issue to my family uh, earlier this week, uh, none of whom are lawyers, and after several fruitless emails, uh, one of my daughters asked, Dad, how would you explain this to Max, who, who is her 10-year-old son? So that actually was a useful exercise, and this is what I came up with. Um, Mark's position is essentially that only kids may decide when they behave badly enough to be disciplined by their parents. And the parents are bound by the kid's decision, and not even Child Protective Services can intervene. 
intervene. The chance position is simpler. The parents can punish the kids only if the kids burn the house down. Now, I haven't run this by Max, but, but I think we can all agree that these would be very bad rules for disciplining children. Uh, no person can be a judge in his or her own case. Uh, no one is self-interested in the outcome of a refer dispute, uh, as the exemption claimant can be an impartial adjudicator of what a substantial burden is. Now, there's more to my position than that. Mark and Chad basically read substantial out of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. But the legislative history and canons of statutory interpretation require that substantial be read to have independent meaning. And it's clear from the legislative history that Congress thought it had independent meaning. When uh, Refer was coming down the stretch, and, uh, and it looked like Harry Reid's amendments to exempt prisons from the reach of REFRA. Now, of course, at that point, uh, everyone thought REFRA would apply to state action and state prisons, therefore, as well as simply federal action. Uh, the proponents of REFRA and its co-sponsors in the Senate felt threatened enough by that that they decided to co-opt the Reed Amendment, and that's how Substantial got into the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And both Kennedy and Hatch took to the floor Senators Kennedy and, Hatch, Kennedy and Hatch took to the floor and emphasized that by putting in substantial, that meant that not every burden on religion is entitled to relief. Only big burdens on religion are entitled to relief. And they didn't say it expressly, but it's, it, it is obvious in the debates that they anticipated that courts would review this. Uh, it wouldn't have made any sense to put substantial in to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to foreclose refer relief from certain burdens. If the refer claimant could decide uh, without judicial review what substantial meant, that just would have been an empty exercise. Uh, and finally, uh, I'll say, the Supreme Court has adjudicated substantiality for a very long time, both before and after the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. There's the Bronfeld case. There's the Tony and Susie Alamo Foundation case. There is uh, the Hernandez case, the Gonzalez case. Uh, in fact, even the cases most beloved of a religious, accommod religious accommodationist, uh, Sherbert and Yoder, involved the courts assessing the burden that was alleged by the claimant and deciding in those cases that it was substantial. It wasn't until Hobby Lobby that this idea arose that courts were disabled from assessing the substantiality of a burden and were restricted only to sincerity and to the uh, substantiality of the penalty for violating a law. Now, uh, Mark is shortly going, over to, going to hit me over the head with the Thomas case and the religious question doctrine, so I'll close with, with, with which uh, uh, is admittedly the most difficult part of my argument. And that is how courts can judge substantiality without making theological judgments, because I agree with Mark that courts are barred from doing that. <coughs> and I do agree with Mark, and, and I think Chad has made the same point, that the lower courts in the Zubi cases generally failed at this. Um, it's clear to me, at least, that uh, when the courts and the claimants in the lower court cases are talking about uh, complicity, their ships passing in the night. The claimants are talking about theological complicity, and the courts are talking about legal complicity, and, and they're not the same things. But of course, that's the key to how courts can adjudicate these cases. They can adjudicate these cases on the basis of secular law, but they need to make clear that they're not interpreting the claimants' theological claims. Uh, I think a good example of this is the Hosanna Tabor case. The, uh, the case about the ministerial exemption, exception. Uh, the court held there that secular courts can't tell a religious congregation who its minister is. Uh, courts have no competence, they have no power to interpret Lutheran theology. It was a Lutheran uh, church of school at stake in that case. They, they can't interpret Lutheran theology and then tell a Lutheran congregation who a Lutheran minister is. But they can and they must define minister for the purpose of 
uh, administering the ministerial exception. If you're going to give employers relief from substantial liability for discriminating on the basis of disability, you can't let lawyers be in charge. I mean, you can't let employers be in charge of the breadth of that exemption. Courts have to administer that exemption. And, and so the Supreme Court in Hosanna Tabor gave us a secular definition of minister, however strange that sounds. So in the refra complicity cases, uh, I would agree that courts are prohibited from telling Catholics whether they are complicit in the sin of contraception when they self-certify to opt out of the contraception mandate. But courts can rely on secular conceptions of liability. Uh, the law has lots of those. Uh, and uh, at least, well, all, most of us in this room have engaged in long and desperate struggles with uh, proximate cause and factual causation and products liability, uh, which cut off uh, responsibility for one's acts, even when they later result in harm. Courts can rely on those secular conceptions to decide whether the burden alleged by the claimant is a legally cognizable, uh, is legally cognizable and of sufficient way to justify exemption relief. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to uh, contest these matters with, uh, with Brad. Thanks uh, to all of you for coming, and my particular thanks to Bob and Michael for organizing the conference. Now, what I'm going to say is going to be fairly pedestrian, obvious, perhaps uh, uh, somewhat duplicative uh, compared to the other presentations. Uh, maybe it nevertheless will be helpful. Now, my claim is not that, uh, 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 is not one of, that, that a, that, that it's a substantial theological burden. My claim is people are entitled to decide what their religion requires, and then if the government imposes a substantial burden, such as making them pay large amounts of money or running them out of business, we have a substantial burden on religious exercise. So I, I don't think Fred's characterized my argument uh, correctly. Now, everybody has to be a judge of what his or her own religion requires, so, so that's it. Now, Lots of slides, I'm not going to discuss them all, of course. Uh, but you can read them, they're on the web page. Uh, government harms uh, religious conscience um, uh, in order to do what it considers to be good. That's our point here as to why we have a conflict. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, government may allow a private person or an association to withhold a benefit from someone else to achieve a different good which is the good of religious liberty and protection of religious conscience. And I think we ought to be very careful about equating a burden that may be imposed, if we want to call it a burden, by a private individual or association not granting someone something they want, or even something the government says that they ought to provide, versus, versus the government imposing a burden. We compare the 14th Amendment uh, with the 13th, and we see the government imposed burdens. Uh, we look very closely at them, privately imposed burdens. We insist on something quite a lot stronger before we consider that to be uh, a violation of another person's uh, uh, constitutional, in that case, uh, rights. And it's not just a matter of, uh, of individual rights, of course. It's very much a matter of uh, religious association. Okay. So complicity, one of the most important moral questions discussed for centuries by religious thinkers is when do we consider our actions to make us complicit? And therefore, when are our actions immoral and in violation of, of religious conscience? They're part of religious belief, deeply informing religious conscience. And here we have, here we have the, uh, the, uh, the brief from uh, how many is it? Uh, 50 Catholic theologians and ethicists, as amicus curiae, in support of the petitioners in, in, in Zubik. Uh, religion has something real to say about complicity, and it's a religious concept that it has to say about it. It's not proximate cause. 
And here's what some of what the Catholic theologians say, and we'll skip right through it, but I don't think the courts are entitled to tell Catholics whether what they're doing is an impermissible act of material co cooperation. Uh, they're not equipped and they're not permitted. Now, of course, uh, uh, here we're just going to run through these really quickly. You can read them uh, online if you want. We know City of Bernie. Uh, we know here's my Venn diagram. We get back to junior high on how this all how this all works. Um, uh, Congress certainly can control what Health and Human Services does. And um, does RIFR apply? Of course, it applies. So we don't really need this, to talk much about this. But we do know RIFRA took us back, or was intended in significant part, to take us back to the pre-Smith rules. And so we have Thomas versus the Review Board. Thomas drew a line as to complicity in creating war materials. It's not for us to say the line he drew was unreasonable. It's a theological question what the line should be. Steel for victory. He was willing to make steel, and that was for victory. He wasn't willing to make tank turrets. He drew a line. We have to respect that. There's a, there's a tank in case you care about it. And it's not within the judicial function to inquire whether he had the correct religious view of complicity. Now, um, Big Pharma, you can read that slide. Why do all FDA approved uh, means seem to be uh, given free? But that's maybe Big Pharma, but we'll leave that. Um, people honestly believe that some of these drugs are abortifacients. If you're willing to make people do abortions, okay, okay. But uh, I think most people understand you've crossed a real line at that point. Now, moral complicity. Uh, again, it, this, is a, this is a matter of, uh, of, of religious concern. How is my exercise of religion burdened when somebody else, my employee, does something my religion prohibits me from? That's not the point. The point is my actions, my religion prohibits me from engaging in these acts. Now, why does it prohibit it? I have ideas of complicity. It, my religion prohibits it. The government doesn't have to take my view of what is substantial, but the government has to take my view, if I'm sincere, as to what my religion prohibits me from doing. And complicity is a part of that. It's always been under, for centuries we've had religious discussions of this. What if the law required, and people say, well, there's an intervening person who's going to decide where to use the services, so complicity is unreasonable to find. Uh, what if a feminist group was required to buy, to, to provide coupons to workers that they could use to buy magazines? Lots of magazines. One of them was Hustler. What if a vegan group was required to, to provide coupons for restaurants? Well, lots of restaurants. One of them was a <coughs> steakhouse. And so, um, now, the initial mandate, I mean, we ask ourselves, what, where is the administration going? Very narrow original, man, uh, original uh, 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 accommodation. Four-part test, Jesus, Billy Graham, World Vision wouldn't satisfy. If you serve people who aren't part of your religion, if you actually think it's important to serve poor people without discriminating against them because they're not part of your faith, gee, you must not be religious enough. And that really goes along with the administration's view and Hosanna Tabor uh, agree or disagree about whether the teacher was a minister. I will tell you, the administration said no ministerial exception. Lost 9-0 on that. Okay. Now this new version, we can argue whether the new version of accommodation is sufficient or not. Uh, the little sister says you're using the structure of health care that, that uh, uh, provision that we have created and you're requiring through that structure for these things to be provided, and we can't allow that. Now, here's the, the, the for, famous Form 700. Um, notice on the back of Form 700, which HHS wanted to make everybody use who wanted to claim a religious exemption. Notice to third party administrators, da da da. This is notice to the third party administrator of the obligations of the third party administration administrator that they're self set forth in the CFR. This is telling the administrator to do that which the, uh, or the religious organization believes is wrong. Instructing someone to do that which you believe is wrong, uh, that everybody has to think, it seems to me, that that's complicity. And it's a little bit like, we know that the Quaker who doesn't want to serve can't say, well, I'm not going to tell you that I don't want to serve, because if I tell you that, 
then you'll draft somebody else in my place. So I can't tell you. These religious organizations have no problem with telling the government, as I understand, and they should not have a problem with saying, we want an exemption. They're being asked to send in a form that instructs their third party administrator to do, to do something. And it seems to me, it seems to me that uh, that 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 is uh, that that is indeed uh, quite different. And you can't just say, well, the law. If you don't send this, in, and of course, it also becomes part of your plan documents. Okay, so you're required to make it part of your plan documents. Why does the government need that? The government doesn't need that. Um, now, here's the alternative form that the Supreme Court that supposedly responds to the Supreme Court's order in Wheaton College. It actually goes beyond what the Supreme Court court said was to be, uh, was required in Wheaton College. Let me finish, and I'll, uh, I'm sorry, I, I hope you can listen as fast as I can talk. Um, uh, you, you can tell I care a little bit about this stuff. Um, it seems to me that a Quaker can be required to say, I won't serve. We all would agree, I think it's problematic to say to the Quaker, you must pick someone to serve. You must designate someone who will choose a replacement draftee who will go kill people in a war. The government doesn't need that. The government needs the statement that I'm not going to serve, and that's enough information to, for the government to do what it needs to do. And so essentially, people who say, well, your complicity understanding doesn't fit with what we learned in first year torts with proximate cause are denying the truth of, of centuries-long religious traditions as to a central part of religion, which is how we understand what we are responsible for. And it is the act of the objector. It's not the act of the person who ultimately uses the goods or services. That's not the act. It's the act of the objector that the objector says violates his or her faith. And that's where the focus needs to be. If if there's a compelling interest, and there's no other way to meet a government's compelling interest, well, then RIFRA says, go ahead. You can penalize them, charge them millions of dollars if you want, maybe little hundreds of thousands, excuse me, uh, and or run them out of business if you want, or tell them they can't run a hospital, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Uh, that's a substantial burden. Okay. Compelling interest, no other way to do it other than by burdening their religion in that way. River permits it, otherwise it doesn't. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation, this is uh, it's great fun. I always wondered about that brief for 50 Catholic theologians, like were they sweating when they had 43? Like we gotta find someone. <laughs> and, and if the first 51st guy came along, did they say, no, no, sorry, we're good at 50. There's something impressive about it. Uh, it's an over 50. Um, so I want to tell a story that may explain my orientation uh, towards this area of law. Um, and it's about the summer after my 1L year. A lot of my students are asking me questions about what I did after my 1L uh, year. Um, I worked for a, the landlord-tenant clinic in my law school. And one of my clients was Seth. And Seth uh, lived in public housing. He had an apartment in a public housing complex. And he had a problem with hoarding books, um, which I think is probably a lot of to share. Um, this was pretty extreme, though, to the point where it was a safety hazard um, and a fire hazard. And so the Public Housing Authority uh, uh, threatened him with eviction. And so we were, we were called upon to try and figure something out. Um, and the first thing we talked about is, is there a way we can accommodate um, Seth? Um, Seth was schizophrenic. Um, and his apartment was filthy and filled with books, which he insisted all were great books. Um, uh, and his collection was going to rival uh, Yale University. Um, so we sat down with the head of the public uh, housing authority and tried to work on an accommodation. Could we give him a bigger apartment? Could we give him another apartment where he could just store his book? Could we find extra storage someplace? Um, could it, I don't know who thought of this one. Could we make his door open out? Because the problem was that you couldn't fully open the door because there were so many books blocking it. Um, all of those suggestions ended up to be uh, uh, real losers. Uh, they would cost a lot of money. I mean, the waiting list for public housing was, was a mile long, and so you didn't want to kick someone out so Seth could store books. Extra storage, maybe extra bookshelves would just be uh, prohibitively expensive. The door opening out had the obvious third party harm problem where you, you smack <laughs> someone um, who's walking down the hall. Um, but I think it was important. So, so Seth lost that battle. Um, 
but I think it was important that we went through the step of asking for an accommodation and finding a compelling interest that outweighed it. There was something about in, in trying to help him out that we first recognized that he was operating under a substantial hardship, even though he was going to lose. That sort of recognition mattered um, in trying to help him. And so I, I come with a similar uh, sort of uh, perspective to these uh, RIFRA cases. And a lot of prison, prison rights cases, which I've read a lot of them, and courts seem to do very poorly with them in the way uh, that I think we did better by Seth. So take a common example where you have uh, uh, a prisoner who's a member of a strange minority religion. Maybe he's the only person who interprets his sacred text that way. He needs something. He needs tarot cards. He needs his meals prepared a certain way or having certain ingredients in or out of them. Uh, he needs that access to a sweat lodge. Um, a lot of courts will say, that's not really a burden at all. Or if it's a burden, it's uh, de minimis. Uh, like, it, it's not that big of a deal. Like, you can miss a couple of your sacred meals. It's OK. Or, or you don't need the tarot cards all the time. Or you don't need to have uh, this meeting at this particular time. They, they, they make him, uh, the prisoner, lose at this very early stage by dismissing out of hand his claim that he's operating not just under a burden, but a substantial burden. Uh, I think that that's actually quite harmful. Um, and I, that's not to say that these prisoners should ultimately win their claims against the prison. They probably should lose. Prisons have lots of compelling interests in sort of the orderly maintenance of the prison, safety concerns, uh, concerns for other inmates. But I think if these prisoners lose, they should lose in the right way after their claim uh, for respect and recognition that they are uh, suffering under a religious burden has been sort of acknowledged and recognized by the parties. So when I come to these cases involving questions of substantial burdens, uh, I want to come to them with sort of a bias towards deference towards the claims of the plaintiffs and, and on this critical question of substantial burden. Um, so uh, Fred's uh, preemptively attacked my position. So I'll, I'll respond a bit, and then I, I want to make some points about his own uh, proposed solution. Um, so Mark gave the right response. Like, we don't read substantial out of the statute. When we look at substantial burden, we look at two things. We say, look, was there a hardship on the person's practice of his religious beliefs? That's one thing. And that's really up to him. And my sense is there's, there's a lot of filtering out at this stage. Like, if it's something you can deal with on your own, you're not going to go through the, the long and costly process and time and money of litigation. If it's not really that much of hardship to you, you'll find some way to adapt or, 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 or uh, to figure out uh, uh, some way you can satisfy your religious beliefs despite what the state is, is claiming to do. Um, so there's that point. I leave that up to the plaintiff. Is there a substantial hardship, uh, burden, pressure on, on his practice of religion? Then there's the amount of pressure, the secular cost that the person is being asked to pay. In the case of Hobby Lobby, that's fines uh, or other penalties. Um, so you look at the secular cost, and that's what you look in terms of what's substantial and what's not substantial. You leave the question of whether the uh, plaintiff's <coughs> religion is, is substantially burdened to him. So we, we don't read substantial out of the statute altogether. I also think that there's uh, a plausible thing of the uh, legislative history, which is more of a mess than I think Fred lets on. I think they say a bunch of contradictory and very confusing things um, about what substantial means. Uh, but I do think there's a way to, to say substantial burden means uh, a burden of substance, that you're putting pressure on someone to change their practice or to violate their uh, religious beliefs. And this is a way of getting out those cases where just like bad stuff happens to a religious believer. In Ling, their sacred forest is destroyed. Bad stuff happened. That's undoubtedly a burden. And in normal person speak, that's obviously a burden. But you might say, oh, that's not really the kind of burden that RIFRA uh, 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 recognizes, because we're not putting pressure on you to change your religious behavior. So substantial burden could mean like a burden that's distinct from just bad stuff happening to your religion uh, caused by the government. Um, so I also think, now let's go to Fred's. Uh, proposed solution. Now, Fred wants to look at substantial burden under the lens of tort law. Um, I think this has some problems. I think th the first problem is um, he still hasn't given us a, a sense of how to read substantial. I think if you read his paper and his analysis, he's just finding no burden. So I'm still curious as to how tort law can help us determine sort of the, the, how to quantify when a burden is substantial or not. Because uh, under my understanding, of his analysis of these cases. He just said, there's no burden, because they're not uh, the but-for cause of, uh, of uh, uh, contraception or, uh, coverage in the Zubik case. So he really hasn't helped us unlock the mystery of substantial burdens. Uh, so, and then I think there's further questions about like why should we look to tort law 
rather than say criminal law. There's a rather persuasive uh, amicus brief uh, in the Zubik case that says, look, criminal law deals with ideas of complicity, accomplice liability all the time. And in fact, they say under criminal law, you know, the, the, the responsibility of uh, or what little sisters of the poor does is actually that satisfies the complex side. So why not use criminal law rather than tort law? If we have to just pick some uh, random area of law uh, and find this appropriate, I mean, why, why not go to the criminal law uh, toolbox rather than the, the uh, tort law uh, toolbox? And my God, tort law is so confusing, right? I mean, <laughs> you're with me on this. Like, when does the free act uh, of an agent actually act as an intervening cause, and when doesn't it? I don't know. Um, what exactly is proximate cause? This is the part where you say, well, it's, it's a moral and policy choice. Like, oh, isn't that just, I mean, so I, I'm not even sure tort law is the best area of law just because it's so murky. Um, and it leads into these interpretive swamps. I, I feel like my solution is cleaner when you say, for these religious questions of like causation, just leave it to the religious believer and we'll deal with the question of secular costs. Um, and then I think the final point is I think Fred um, and a lot of the lower circuit court cases miss what they're really complaining about. And it's, the question here is like, can an accommodation also be failed to be fully accommodating? Because they may, they're, what they're saying is like, look, the accommodation you give us still makes us feel complicit in this. And so maybe, maybe their objection isn't like, we're facilitating or paying for abortion. Mm -hmm. If that was their main objection, then it's like, okay, this accommodation takes care of it. But they don't even want to be participating in the scheme at all. And so, Making them sign a piece of paper, and if they think that's substantial, that's like great for me. Like, if, if, if the question put to them is like, you have to self-certify or pay a large fine, large fine looks substantial to me, and if you think this signing piece of paper is a really uh, substantial hardship on your practice of religion, that's fine with me too. I, it seems like if the choice is phrased that way, like sign this piece of paper or raise your hand or pay a big fine, I don't know, tort law, criminal law, there seems to be pressure put on the religious actor and facing him with a, a, an enormous penalty if he fails to comply. Um, I know Fred will have things to say in response, so I think I'll stop there. Thanks. So who wins? <laughs> Secular side or the religious side? The gay rights activists or the churches? Who wins the argument? I would actually submit that RIFRA and religious accommodation is actually in a state of chaos right now. For instance, if Hobby Lobby had been constrained by a state law in a state that didn't have its own RIFRA, Hobby Lobby would have lost. RIFRA only applies to federal laws. It only applies to laws that are passed by, the, by Congress and the federal government. And not every state has a RIFRA. And now that Hobby Lobby has, been, um, has come down, and there are several other cases that have come down, including Obergefell and other decisions, it's harder and harder to pass state-level RIFRA laws, as we can see from Arizona and Indiana. So there's really kind of a chaotic mess going on when it comes to religious accommodation in America. So I'm going to start with that. So who wins? Well, you want to avoid a situation in which religion dominates and somebody's religious beliefs governs all that goes on with their employees and whatever rights they get dispensed to the people who live in their area. You want to avoid a situation in which a governmental official can say, hey, I'm not going to follow the law because it violates my beliefs. On the other hand, you want to apply a situation where courts apply a plausibility, rationality, or sincerity test on religion because under that, re under that matrix, religion would lose every time. So, what do you do in that type of situation where you have changing, evolving, and emerging laws and religion is expected to constantly catch up with it? I don't think that's an answer either. So what I've done is I've come up with a very Pollyanna type of approach to this issue, and you can read it in my paper. But before I get there, there's, you know, further illustrating, I guess, the chaos that, that we're dealing with. Um, in New Mexico, there was a photographer case involving a company called Elaine Photography, and that case went up to the Supreme Court of the state of New Mexico on the issue of whether or not the photographer <coughs> should be compelled against their religious beliefs to film a same-sex commitment ceremony. The just, Chief Justice of the New Mexico Supreme Court in his decision, um, in the case of Elaine Photography versus Willick in 2013, said that pretty much the, the 
photographers had to compromise, and that compromise was the price of citizenship, to use the language. Is compromise the price of citizenship? Do you have to surrender your religious rights in order to live in a society under this current matrix of law? I know there's been some discussion about that this should have been something discussed 20 years ago, but I would submit that the jury is still out on these issues. We don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do in the bakery cases or in the photography cases. The Supreme Court denied cert on the Elaine photography case. And I think it was because they raised the issue of the uh, free, uh, free speech rather than free exercise, which wasn't brought up in the, in the petition for certiorari. But the reality is, those issues are still being decided. RIFRA doesn't apply in every state. Hobby Lobby would not apply at the state level. So what are we going to do? We're still on the courthouse steps. In 2005, I was lobbying at the Sacramento legislature, California state legislature, uh, on a land use bill that we were trying to get passed, which would be analogous to a federal level RILUPA, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. And so I met with a lobby, with a legislator, a state senator, who was a gay rights activist. And he said, we need to get your organization, I was representing a church, we need to get your organization on board on a same-sex marriage bill. And I said, well, why do you want to do that? And he said, because it would benefit both of us. We would be able to get married, and we would be able to build protections in for your organization so that you wouldn't have to participate. We could address this up front before we actually went further into the legislative process. I, at the time, I said, well, you know, it's really not our issue, and I, you know, it was going to be a real hot potato, so I didn't, I didn't deal with it. But afterwards, you know, after Obergefell, after, well, actually after Profit 8 came out, after Obergefell, all these decisions, decisions came down, and I wish we would have had that conversation. I wish we would have discussed ways that we could have amicably resolved that dispute at that time. In a speech in 2015, Elder Dallin Oaks of the Church of Latter-day Saints described an approach that I thought would work well in this type of situation. He said, my thesis is all want to live together in happiness, harmony, and peace. To achieve that common goal and for all contending parties to achieve their most important personal goals, we must learn and practice mutual respect for others whose beliefs, values, and behaviors differ from our own. As Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes observed, the Constitution is made for people of fundamentally different views. Differences on precious fundamentals are with us forever. We must not let them disable our democracy or cripple our society. This does not anticipate that we will deny or abandon our differences, but that we will learn to live with those laws, institutions, and persons who do not share them. We may have cultural differences, but we should not have culture wars. And I would agree with that. So how do we approach this issue? It sounds like a culture war to me when I'm hearing people arguing both sides of this issue, but what do we do? Well, I would propose that we attempt an ADR approach to preemptively address some of the issues that are currently going on with this discussion. We're still in a situation where we can do so. We're still on the courthouse steps. And here's a proposal for a way that I would recommend doing this. The first step is, I'm going to call it an airing of grievances to discuss the festivist religion. And that is to seek to understand motivations and encourage facilitated dialogue between sides so that each can present his or her viewpoint fully without being judged. Each side can present an ideological perspective during this step, but to succeed they should do so with the goal of increasing understanding rather than simply beating the other side. Further, each side can discuss religious beliefs, history, how it previously resolved such disputes, etc. This is the, found, the foundational framework for it. You have beliefs, everybody's got beliefs. What is your ideological framework? How are you approaching the issue? You can talk about it then. And then, you can, working together, you develop a list of practical, not ideological, issues that must be addressed cooperatively. What is the actual practical issue that needs to be resolved? You determine a timeline for addressing those issues. And for instance, in a wedding cake case, how early a cake is ordered, etc., or you can work on accommodations. I'm sort of modeling this after the EEOC approach to addressing Title VII claims, where the EEOC will has a list of recommended alternatives and recommended accommodations that you can go through. This is an informal process. Number three, determine to what issues both sides may stipulate and exclude them from the dispute. How many times do you argue with somebody about something you actually agree with them on? You know, I've. It's interesting, even in these issues, when you have people who are strongly 
disagreeing on a fundamental perspective on this. They actually agree on some of their main arguments that they're still arguing, even though they don't need to anymore. You determine the number four, determine the contended areas and focus on them so that they are as specific as possible. So take the areas of contention and narrow them down to the extent possible so you can figure out exactly what you're dealing with. And propose specific practical alternatives to the issues. Both sides should perceive that they are working cooperatively to try to resolve the issue that is before them. Isolate irreconcilable issues that cannot be resolved. We're not going to be able to resolve everything. Work to resolve those issues or develop alternative accommodations. And then, with the fundamental dispute, seek to de develop a narrowly tailored accommodation to address that issue. Now, I recognize that there are issues and people who are involved in some of these cases where ideology trumps practicality, where they don't really want the cake as much as they want to win the case. Or where they don't really, you know, where they're 100% sure that they're not going to ever concede any point on that. And this does not address those issues. This is for the 80 to 90 percent of people who simply want to get along in a society. So how do you get this, these people together in the same room? Well, one of the ways is actually, to actually follow a collective <coughs> bargaining approach where you have employers and labor unions working together and you're trying to come to a resolution. And one of the ways I would propose doing this is to hold summits between major advocacy <laughs> groups on all sides to promote this approach by demonstrating the cost and risks of risks the litigation and legislation and the unpredictability of the political process. Secondly, obtain consensus to participate in multicultural problem-solving exercises. Now, I'm referring to multicultural rather than neutral ground. This is not a time to set aside everything and be neutral. It's a time to describe your position and stand by where you stand, and everybody will maintain their, their moral or, or religious positions on an issue. And there could be standing bilateral committees that could be be convened to address those issues, and then when an actual conflict emerges after you've gone through this process, key negotiators can be drawn from both parties to develop a framework of the issue and identify the areas of concern and work mutually toward a resolution of the dispute that is currently at bar. Thank you. Do you want to have a, a minute or so of response to? A minute or ten? Not ten. <laughs> you get one. One minute. Is that a burden if you only get a minute? I'll talk fast. Mm -hmm. I think I have actually described Marx and uh, Chad's position. They just don't know it. <laughs> but I'll explain it in this way. As a practical matter, well, uh, burden is divided into two parts conceptually. So there's religious costs. Uh, this is like a Sesame Street puppet thing, I guess. So there's religious costs over here uh, if you obey the burdensome law, and then there's secular costs over here if you disobey it. And what they're saying is, hey, this, the, the believer's in charge of this side, and the government can only evaluate this. Um, but let me ask you, how many laws are you aware of in fact, if, I, if your grade in a class depended on listing 10 laws for which the sanctions were trivial or insignificant, could, could you name 10? Uh, I don't think you can. And, and I've read the literature, I've read Michael's paper, I've read their papers. All the hypotheticals are sort of fantastic. They're Martian hypotheticals. They're not things that would ever happen here. So that means that a substantial burden really depends on this. When you're analyzing the strength of the secular costs, you're not analyzing anything significant unless there are a substantial number of laws that have trivial sanctions for disobedience. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a Mormon. Um, uh, we don't use uh, wine in, our, um, in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So if the government were to fine uh, everyone a bazillion dollars for drinking wine or possessing wine, there's no burden on us. We don't drink. Um, we don't use it in our rituals. I mean, what really matters is whether there's a religious cost. This is what is dispositive, and this is just always hypothetical. So it's a practical matter uh, by removing government review of religious costs, you're putting um, 
as I said, you're putting the kids in charge of the discipline. Well, I think that's absolutely wrong. <laughs> because, um, because if the government prohibits you from doing what your religion requires, or requires you to do what your religion prohibits, and then uh, you are, you have a burden on religion. Now the question is how substantial is that burden? And that depends on what happens to you if you disobey. And if what happens to you in all of these cases that are litigated is you're run out of the wedding photography business. You're run out of the business of, of, of renting out a couple of apartments to make money when you're a widow and that's the way you make money. Uh, you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees. We don't have these cases where the government says, you know, here's a $20 ticket. Now we might occasionally, and I would have to think about whether the dignitary harm of having to pay the $20 ticket uh, makes the government complicit then to turn things around in denigrating the person's religion. Well, of course, that, that, that's another three hour conversation. But uh, no, it has not been correctly described. There are two questions. Are you being forced to do what your religion prohibits you from doing or prohibited from doing what it requires? That's the religious burden. And I get to decide what my religion requires, as long as I'm sincere. What happens to me if I disobey the state? That's where the substantiality comes in, except in the case where I may admit that, you know, my religion says I don't really need to do this. I could do it three times a week. I want to do it four. Well, then it becomes a little difficult to figure, and, and, and that's one that's tougher, where the person says their religion, they wouldn't actually have to violate the religious conscience to do what the government requires them to do. That's one where I'm willing to talk. But violation of religious conscience is a burden, pure and simple. Substantiality has to do with what happens to you if you refuse to violate your religious conscience. <coughs> I agree with both Fred and Mark, if that's, if that's possible. Because um, going back just to my, my predisposition in these cases, yeah, fine. I mean, there may not be very many cases where the government uh, pressure put upon you is not substantial. Fine. I feel like, again, if the concern is we'll get tons and tons of cases, I feel, well, that concern may be overblown. Um, but also, I think a lot of it, uh, uh, both historically, but also prospectively, like because a lot of the filtering again may be done on the plaintiff's side. Like, ah, you know, if it's if it's a slight cost, I'm probably not going to bring the lawsuit. And then, okay, if I bring the lawsuit anyway, then you just decide at the compelling interest stage. And maybe I have more faith that courts will be uh, willing to find a compelling interest than Fred does. Um, but this sort of the, the the idea that sort of like we need to to uh, really choke things off at the substantial burden level, otherwise we'll have all these frivolous cases. I, I just, I mean. I guess it's an empirical question how big that risk is and whether we're, we're uh, willing to take it. Thank you. All right, we have some time for questions. Looks like we've got a lot of them. <laughs> so thank you for your presentation. I, one of the intuitions to me behind our respect for religious freedom is that it's a really um, hard thing to put somebody in a position where they have to choose between obeying God and obeying the government. So that, that's just a, a harsh place to put somebody, and we should avoid doing that unless we really need to for some important reason. Um, but, you know, Mark, you're, you're hypothetical about the person who, well, whether I do three times or four times, you know, that, that kind of raises the question of, well, what are the consequences if you don't or you do engage in this particular act, right? So what about a substantial burden test that says, please describe for me what in your religious framework you think are going to be the consequences if you engage in this act or you don't engage in this act. And if on the one hand it's something that they think, you know, their damnation is the result, that's, that's a substantial burden. But if it's something that could be resolved through some relatively simple ritual or something, then that's not a substantial burden. In other words, focus on the extent to which we're putting the person in a really difficult dilemma as a result of the choice serving us for force to make. Well, I, I mean, I agree that that's a problem, but that's a consequentialist view of religion. Not everybody thinks in terms of, gee, if I don't do this, something bad will happen to me which is a, it, I know it's a sort, that's not really exactly the way you put it, 
but it's not like, gee, I'm going to go to hell if I don't do this, and therefore it's a substantial burden. Uh, you know, it, it seems to me that, that we have many cases where a person simply says it will violate my religious conscience if I'm required to do this. It is wrong for me to do it. And it seems to me in that instance we need to, if the person's sincere, take that at face value. There is then a burden on religion. Then what's the state going to do to the person? That's probably where the substantiality comes in. If the person says, well, you know, I'd really like to have the sacred meal four times a week, but my religion says it's okay if I have three, maybe we say that the person has admitted that, that it wouldn't put them to the choice of obeying God or obeying man. But those are the tough cases. But those haven't tended to be the cases we've seen. The cases we've seen where people have said it would be sinful for me to do this. And therefore, I cannot, in good conscience, do it. Those other cases are harder, I agree. They're harder. But that's not the kind of case we've seen. That might be even uh, easier, because I, 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 I'm not, or more expensive than that. It may just be like, my religion uh, highly recommends that I do this, and this government uh, uh, program makes it harder for me to do those things that my religion really recommends. And the government says, well, why don't you do these other things? I mean, and he says, well, I'd rather do these things. Uh, that's, that's how I understand my religion. And is the government going to come back and say, eh, no, we, or the courts are going to be the judge to say, like, yeah, no, we, we think our way is better. So you should, you should do the things we say, and that'll make up for the, the, the other uh, uh, failings you have. I just, I, I, that makes me very uncomfortable when, the, when you put courts in position of saying, yeah, it's like, well, but, but our understanding of your religion is if you do this ritual three times, it makes up for those four sins, so we're good. Yeah, that's, that's no, no, it doesn't. If, if the person says it's a sin, if God prohibits it, right. we're done. If that's we're sincere. Done. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, but what about, the case, what, what about the case where the religion says this is a, a great thing you do it? It's not required. Failing to do it is not sinful. They well, that's, even... that's, that's troubling, but it doesn't raise this truly difficult question mm -hmm. of being put to the choice between obeying God and obeying man. That's the truly difficult one. The others, you know, I, I'm, I'm open to being persuaded. It's tough for the government to decide, well, how important is it that your religion recommends this? That's tough, and I'm, I'm open to different views on that. But if you say my religion requires it or prohibits it, and then uh, and you're sincere, the question is, what will the government do to you? That's where the substantiality comes in. I just want to add that, that it's really not a tough question. The Arlupa amendments to refer prohibited right. centrality. And so if the religious claimant says, I mean, inside the claimant may be thinking, well, you know, maybe three is good enough, but I'd rather do it four, then we're also done. Yeah. That's not a question of centrality. That's just not. Oh, I but that's something I'm for, a threat on this. This is great. No, that's not a question of centrality. <laughs> Shifting coalitions. Mark, I, I want to believe your, your view, but I wonder what you do with this hypothetical. Oh, okay, good. Um, so the Ebola situation in Liberia presented, it seems to me, a situation where you have the true test of religious sincerity in the washing of the body. Uh, the initial reaction was, what do you mean we can't wash the bodies? This is important for the salvation of the person whose body is being washed. And, and so the initial reaction with the Carter Center was, but how do, we, how do we communicate about Ebola? And there was such distrust in the government's uh, purpose that there was no way to get through without a, a number of mediations. And that's why I'm drawn to the mediation example to try to understand the nature of the body washing and its religion and its religious character and to try to understand also whether or not the religious community was really confronting that religious belief in light of all of the important things. I'm thinking about David and the showbread. I'm thinking about situations of emergencies where um, religious organizations have adopted their beliefs, which could be called very, very much central beliefs. And I wonder whether there is um, a, a way for a mediated conversation to, to play a part in that, um, as opposed to making generalized determinations about how important diversity is and religious pluralism is, and, and because we make a general determination, we're going to have to um, say it's all about substantial burden. 
but whether or not, in fact, often the religious organization may, or religious believer may not have confronted the centrality of the belief until they've understood all of the other values that are involved. I, I don't mind having a conversation, but the body's decomposing. Uh, is the person, it's Antigone. Will, will, will you allow the body to be properly treated or not? Now, I think the state may have a compelling interest in saying we're gonna have a communicable disease and you just can't do it. Uh, on the other hand, what if the person says, I'm gonna wash the body and bury it, and then I'm willing to go into quarantine for 60 days? Uh, I would argue the person ought to be able to risk their life in that circumstance. Perhaps not always, but in that cir circumstance, why not? But sometimes there's no time to do this. It's great to talk, but of course the problem is we talk and we end up with very different points of view and we don't reach agreement. Wonderful to talk. You know, I would almost say you can find, work to find a solution on it. Is it possible to wash the body without touching the body? Can you run it through a body wash? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there a way to do it? Brushless has to be brushless. You know, where you, could, where you can accommodate the issue rather than coming up with a binary yes or no. And that's what, that's what was done. So that's But of course, the conversation usually is, uh, you won't photograph our commitment ceremony, therefore you will be fined. It's not a conversation. Tell me about what, why you don't want to, to do this. Um, uh, you know, I might not do it very well, because you know, I'm, I'm creating celebratory art, and, and, and I really want to believe in what I'm doing. I don't think I do it very well. Here's a person down the street who was a great wedding photographer. Why didn't you go see them? But in that this is not a question of people wanting to have a conversation. There was no desire there to have a conversation. So if we want to have conversations, let's have conversations. Um, but often it's not desire. You know, I want to jump in on this. I, I do think Mark is right in describing the contemporary situation. But 20 years ago, there was a moment, actually a long moment, maybe most of a decade, in which the shoe was on the other foot. Absolutely true. Um, no one knew where all sorts of different rights conflicts were gonna end up, and especially LGBT rights conflicts. In fact, I don't think we were saying LGBT <coughs> in the 90s. We were just talking about gays and lesbians. And uh, in that circumstance, the religious institutions were not interested in a conversation because there was enormous room uh, in the 90s um, for accommodations that would have given substantial protection but, but you know, they, I know my church thought it could win, and so uh, they weren't interested in talking. And they tried to win and they lost, and so, I mean, Mark is right, but in a sense, you have to lay the, the blame equally on both sides. Oh, I, I quite agree, and there was overreach. Dobson's initiative in Colorado, um, I agreed with the court. That initiative sort of outlawed gays and lesbians, and I, I, I thought the court sort of got that right. Um, but it was an overreach, and when people overreach, bad things happen. Um, and there was a time when there could have been more compassion shown. There was a time when people could have worked together. Maybe there still is that time. Uh, I'm afraid that time has passed, and you do have hegemony coming. Wait, who's the hegemony? Hey, next question. The, uh, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> go, go answer that afterwards. <laughs> Francis Tarver, in consistently uh, deferring to the plaintiff and telling you what their religion tells them to believe, and what their beliefs require them to do, and things like that, do you ever worry about like running into this slippery slope kind of a thing? Um, because the belief may be sincere. Let's say it is sincere. They do sincerely believe in these things. But at what point do you have to say, OK, I, I'm sympathetic to your belief, but you know, I can't constantly defer to well, two questions. Congress has said, with regard to federal law, that in some states have said, with state reference, that there's a substantial burden on religious, religious exercise, 
there must be a compelling governmental interest that's advanced in a way that limits the free exercise of religion as, as, uh, as little as possible. And so if we start seeing hundreds and hundreds of cases, and this is Eugene Bollocks, the genius of his, his approach, the statutory approach. If we start seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases in lots of different contexts, the legislature should then deal with that. But I don't think we're, I don't think we're saying, and we can always test sincerity, as difficult as that is in the Ballard case, we're able, and so the church of the flying spaghetti monster, I don't think anybody's gonna believe that that's sincere. What? <laughs> you know, you know I, I've got to push, push back on that, Mark. Um, I, I think it's incumbent upon you, and to a lesser extent, Chad, but he's starting to agree with me, so I don't want to offend him. <laughs> so the Donald Trump effect, I guess. Um, <laughs> I think it's incumbent upon you to, to explain, I mean, you, you're begging the question, you're assuming what's at issue, which is what substantial burden means, what Congress meant to do. Um, I mean, take the uh, Alamo Foundation case. I mean, the court said, uh, I mean, there's plenty of evidence of sincerity that they believed that complying with the minimum wage interfered with the practice of their religion. And the court said, ah, well, we don't think so. They didn't, go to a, they didn't go to a compelling interest. They just said, you know, we think you can comply in this way. And the Lama Foundation said, well, well, no, we can't. And the court just said, too bad. And there's case after case after case uh, about that. And so, you know, you're insisting that the law now uh, is something different than the law has been and the very law that Reformenta restore. So, you know, my theory is not perfect. Uh, I admit that. Um, I mean, I chose torts, frankly, because I used to teach torts. <laughs> and, 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 but but I'm, willing, I'm willing to live with the consequences. Uh, I think under my theory, if you use tort law, Hobby Lobby would win. And uh, it doesn't fill me with warmth because I, I think actually the nonprofit, for profit line was a good line to draw and the court chose not to. But, but I'll live with that. And if uh, criminal law works better, I'll live with that too, but but it's a theory, well, how right? Do you, what do you mean works better? How do you define works better? Like well, I, I'm willing to let the courts work it out in a common law fashion. Right? And, and how do you deal with hobby? How do you deal with Thomas versus Rebert? It's pre it's pre Rifra said Thomas drew a line, and it's not for a court to decide that he shouldn't have drawn the line there. And that was clearly with regard to complicity. That was pre Smith. That was pre Smith Supreme Court, and. Griffer, Congress intended, uh, to the extent Congress had an intent, we always wonder that, but intended to uh, restore that. And it was clear, Thomas, Thomas decided where complicity started. His well, co-religionists disagreed, he believed that. I would actually argue that Thomas's line made sense. Yeah, so would I. Because <laughs> Thomas said, I'm okay with pressing the steel, but I'm not okay with making the turret. Steal for victory, that's the post. Make that steal and we can, we can win this war. If the tank blew up and Thomas only rolled the steel, he wouldn't get sued for products liability. <laughs> well, his, his, yeah, line made, his line makes sense to you. I don't know that it makes sense to every religious it's, person. I mean, if you and, want to and the question it. is, because complicity, complicity is a deep part of theological tradition for centuries. And... Um, uh, the idea that a court can say, uh, you've got your religion wrong, uh, is, is highly offensive. Well, if, if, if you're going to apply tort theory, though, to it, I would say that, you know, Thomas's line made sense under a tort theory because of the liability. Yeah. I would say, too, that, that the court, the lower courts in Thomas made the same mistake that most of the lower courts in the complicity cases made, is they started arguing with Thomas about his religion instead of deciding whether, uh, on the basis of, sec of secular legal principles, this is the sort of burden from which um, you know, the relevant law should relieve him. And, and I agree with Mark that courts cannot and should not do that. There's just no good thing comes from that. Hey, so um, I have actually two questions. One, I think, is really specific to the Alamo question is, can you just change the form and does that solve the complicity problem? I mean, is it 
that simple to take out the direction to the third party insurer and just have the entity submit something that says, like me, this is not for me, or yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna yeah, do it. Yeah, I'm sorry, if so, your second if question. The, if the solution is that simple, then there's not a whole lot to argue about. But my second point <coughs> is, we seem to be privileging a particular view of religion and what constitutes religion as, as something that sets particular requirements for belief or for action or for behavior. And I wonder where Buddhism might fit into this, this analysis. If it would count as a religion uh, or some other faith tradition that wasn't setting forth a creed or requirements. And, and I'll go back to the presentation this morning about Islamic law and the difference between the two different kinds of charity. So you get an exemption for the required form of charity, the 2.5% of savings, but you don't for the, um, the other form of charity that's not mandatory, but they really a good idea and you should do it. Changing the form helps. The question is, is the government then going to insist that the person that, that in effect the little sisters pick a person to administer their plan that then will be required by the government to do that which the little sisters believe is evil and that they cannot then pick a person that the government will dragoon into this, just like the Quaker should not be required to pick somebody to serve in his place in the military. So there are the two things. There's the form directing the, 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 the TPA that they have this obligation. And there's also the problem of hijacking the system that the Little Sisters have set up. That second one, there may, may be that there's no, there's no, we just have to do it. I mean, it, maybe that just has to be done. And we still have this question of compelling interest. Maybe that's, maybe you just have to do it. And that's fine. The first one, why HHS wouldn't change the form, it had to be ordered in the Wheaton case to do it, shows either cluelessness or hostility. Okay, we've got time. Go ahead, Chad. Oh, I, was, I was looking to your answer. Were you going to answer uh, Mark on that? I, I, think, yeah, I think Mark has mischaracterized uh, the system. Uh, I would say changing the form doesn't help the Little Sisters at all um, because the Little Sisters are going to be in the chain of causation regardless. The government needs the government needs a writing to designate as uh, an instrument under which the plan is operated in order to tell the administrator to supply the contraceptives. If you didn't understand that, you know, that means you're a normal person. Um, they, they have to give some writing to the government that the government can then use to apply against the, the um, the plan administrator. What, what I think Mark is missing is that the government can't make the plan administrator do anything in the case of the Little Sisters because they're a church plan that's exempt from ERISA. And so the only way that the Little Sisters employees are going to get contraceptives from their plan administrator is if the plan administrator <coughs> voluntarily decides that they'd like to make the extra money because the reimbursement provisions are generous and supply the contraceptives on their own. So I actually think the Little Sisters, despite the fact that the Beckett Fund is flogging that case as the most sympathetic one, as the weakest case, um, they're arguing that it's a substantial burden that their plan administrator might voluntarily supply contraceptives to their employees. I, I, you know, I don't think it's outrageous for a court to say, that's a burden, but it's not substantial. 15 second response, the HHS regs require this form so that they can require the TPA to do it. Those regs can be changed. And the whole point of RIFRA is if the government has a way to do it, they have to do it that way. You can't say we set up the regs this way, and so therefore we have to force you to violate religion so we, the government, can do what our regs were set up so that we can't do without you engaging in this action. Those regs can be changed. Okay, well thank you so much to our panelists. Please give them a hand.